one of the most disturbing teachings of traditional Christianity is the one which promises eternal torment for the wicked, literally forever and ever, throughout countless millions of years. I wonder, in fact, whether anyone could even conceive such an idea. It's absolutely beyond the realm of comprehension, and it's not an idea which could possibly have been learned from the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. Let me give you some examples of what happens to the wicked according to the scriptures which Jesus accepted as a divine revelation. I do not mean, of course, that the New Testament is in any way less authoritative, but the question is, does the New Testament overthrow everything taught by the Old about the future punishment of those who do not submit to God? What impression do you gain from this text in Psalm 37, verse 20? I quote, The enemies of the Lord, like fuel in a furnace, are consumed in smoke. Does that sound like perpetual torment? Surely the picture is one of destruction and elimination. A passage in Hosea 13, verse 3, describes the fate of the wicked like this. They will be like the morning cloud and like the dew which soon disappears, like chaff which is blown away from the threshing floor and like smoke from a chimney. John the Baptist was clearly impressed with this description of the fate of the wicked. He predicted that the Messiah would eventually gather his wheat, that is, his true followers, into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Matthew 5, verse 12. From the context, we know that John was speaking of the terrible wrath to come. Matthew 3, verse 7. The Pharisees who did not bear good fruit would be cut down, John said, and thrown into the fire. Matthew 3, verse 10. When Jesus spoke of unquenchable fire, he did not mean that the victims of that fire would be burned consciously forever. What he meant was that the fire would not be extinguished until it had consumed the fuel provided for it. Now, there's nothing about a human being which prevents him from being consumed by fire. Nothing would lead us to think that a man could be tortured in fire forever and ever unless one believes in the natural immortality of all human beings. But that is the rogue doctrine which has caused all our difficulties. Once we see that the Bible does not say that we are inherently immortal, our whole perception of human destiny is altered. The Bible regularly speaks of the wicked being consumed by fire. The fire will not be extinguished, that is, until it's done its job. Jesus spoke of the worm which will never die. This has nothing to do with endless torment. It's the maggot which eats on the rotting flesh of the wicked who have died that Jesus described. It provides a picture of the utter ruin of human persons. Their carcasses will be eaten up or they will be reduced to ashes, as another Old Testament verse says. Speaking of the coming day of God's anger, Malachi wrote, The day is coming, burning like a furnace, and all the arrogant and all the evildoers will be chaff, and the day that is coming will set them ablaze. And you will tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day which I am preparing, says the Lord. You'll find that in Malachi chapter 4, verses 1 and 3. It's a terrible prediction of the destruction of rebellious human beings. Jesus spoke quite often of that punishment of those who refused to heed his message. In Matthew 25, verse 41, Jesus spoke of a time coming when he will say to the wicked, living at the time he returns, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels, and these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Now, what is eternal punishment? Does this mean conscious torture forever? The trouble is that little attention has been paid by Bible readers to this word eternal. Consider the following facts. The brother of Jesus, in his short letter, the book of Jude, spoke of an ancient example of eternal punishment. Jude said that the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, which indulged in gross immorality, provide an example of what Jude called the punishment of eternal fire. Now, I ask you, are Sodom and Gomorrah and their inhabitants being tortured eternally? Did their destruction never end? They suffered the penalty of what the Bible calls eternal fire. Both the cities and their inhabitants were punished with eternal fire. You read this in Jude, verse 7. The people of Sodom and Gomorrah, because of their extreme wickedness, paid the penalty in eternal fire. That's the way the New English Bible translates it. It is clear from the plain facts of history that eternal fire does not burn forever. If it did, it would still be burning Sodom and Gomorrah to this day. No, eternal fire is fire which in the original Greek language of our New Testament is called Aeonian fire. Fire that is of the same type which God will display at the beginning of the Aeon 
or the age to come. Aeonian is a technical word in the New Testament to describe things that are associated with the age to come when Jesus sets up his kingdom. Eternal fire is really a misleading translation. Eternal fire, which destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, means fire characteristic of the coming age when God intervenes, supernatural fire. The same sort of supernatural fire in brimstone, which utterly destroyed the sexually immoral in Sodom and Gomorrah, will burn up their modern counterparts at the end of this age when Jesus comes back. We saw that eternal fire was the agent used by God to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah thousands of years ago. That fire is obviously not still burning, and yet it was called by Jude eternal fire or everlasting fire. Now we must ask this question, was the fire which destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah really an everlasting fire? Obviously not. Then we should handle with care the fate which Jesus promised to the wicked when he said they would suffer everlasting fire in Matthew 25, 41. The solution to the puzzle lies in the word translated eternal or everlasting. In the original Greek of our New Testaments, it's the word which means having to do with the age, that is, the age to come when Jesus comes to set up his kingdom. So you see, what caused the ruin of Sodom and Gomorrah was a supernatural fire and brimstone, which is a warning and an example of the same sort of destructive agent which God will use in the future to eliminate those who persist in disobeying him. When Jesus spoke of the wicked undergoing eternal punishment, he used exactly the same technical term, meaning having to do with the age to come. What the wicked suffer is a supernatural punishment which excludes them from the age to come. The righteous, however, gain eternal life, which, as many scholars know, really means life in the coming age. Please note most carefully, if the everlasting fire of Matthew 25 really means a fire which goes on punishing people forever and ever, then we would have to believe that the fire which destroyed those ancient cities of Sodom and Gomorrah is still burning. When Jesus spoke in Mark 9, 44 to 48, of future judgment on the wicked, he used these awful words. It's better to enter life crippled than having two hands to go into hellfire or Gehenna into the unquenchable fire where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. This warning about future punishment is not an original saying of Jesus. He quotes it word for word from Isaiah 66 and verse 24. Let us use this example as a way to demonstrate how Bible study should be done. When Jesus quotes from the Old Testament, we should always go back to the passage in question and examine its context carefully. In Isaiah 66, 15, we learn that God is going to come in fire to render his anger with fury, for the Lord will execute judgment by fire and by his sword on all flesh, and those slain by the Lord will be many. There then follows a description of the restoration of the land of Israel and the establishment of peace in the land. Finally, Isaiah leaves us a grim picture of the destruction of those who were in opposition to God. Isaiah says this, They shall go forth and look at the carcasses of those who have rebelled against me, for their worm shall not die, nor shall their fire be quenched. Now, is this really a description of disembodied souls being tormented forever? Surely not. What we see here is the maggot and the fire eating away at the dead carcasses of those who've been destroyed in the supernatural fire of God's wrath. In Isaiah 51, 8, Isaiah had written similarly, I quote, The moth will eat them up like a garment, and the worm will eat them like wool. Again, we see the destruction of the wicked, not their perpetual torment. In yet another passage, there is this account of the burning wrath of God to come. My breath will consume you like a fire, and the peoples will be burned to lime, like cut thorns which are burned in the fire. Again, we see the fate of the wicked is destruction, not a continued life of suffering. These are the verses which Jesus had in mind when he spoke of the unquenchable fire of hell. Well, you may be saying, what about those passages in the book of Revelation which speak of the smoke of torment going up forever and ever? Once again, this material is taken from the Old Testament. In Isaiah 34, verses 9 and 10, there's a description of a terrific judgment coming on the land of Edom in the day of God's vengeance. The land, we read, is going to become burning pitch. It will not be quenched night or day. Its smoke shall go up forever. From generation to generation it will be desolate. 
this passage should be compared with a similar threat of unquenchable fire for Jerusalem in Jeremiah 7 verse 20. Now clearly this is not a fire which will never go out. It's a fire which consumes its victims, putting them beyond any hope of rescue. Remember that according to Jude 7, an everlasting fire destroyed the ancient people of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now what sort of fire was this? Is it still burning? Clearly not. It was a supernatural, all-consuming conflagration that left nothing but total destruction in its path. So it will be with the wicked in the book of Revelation. The city of Babylon will be utterly destroyed in a single hour. The smoke of her torment will go up continuously, we read in Revelation 19, verse 3, like the smoke of Edom in Isaiah uh, chapter 34. Yet the judgment is complete in one hour, as Revelation 18.10 says. So in Revelation 14.11, there are those who are involved in the supreme wickedness at the end of the age. Of these we read that the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. Psalm 37.20 reveals that the wicked will be consumed in smoke. A perpetual smoke does not imply an endless conscious torment. The smoke which goes on ascending will be a grim reminder of the awful fate of the wicked. They will be deprived of precious life forever. Another psalm, Psalm 68 verse 2, speaks of the wicked perishing like wax melting before God's fire. Now perishing means perishing. The primary meaning of the word is to lose one's life. It would be quite contradictory of this statement to say that the wicked do not perish but remain alive in torment. Jesus spoke of the people on whom a tower had fallen in Luke 13:4. Those people had perished. The same word is used of the fate of the wicked. To perish means to be burned up. It does not mean to remain alive in constant agony throughout all eternity. There are many biblical commentators who have complained that our traditional idea that the wicked remain alive forever makes a nonsense of the word perish. It reverses the obvious meaning of words. If men and women perish, they go out of existence. From the very creation of man, the penalty for sin was announced as death. And what did death mean to Adam? Here's what God said to him. You are dust, and to dust you're going to return. Genesis 3.19 Now that's the meaning of death. It means the cessation of conscious existence. In the case of the persistently wicked, it will mean being reduced to ashes, consumed in smoke, suffering the penalty of eternal death. An eternal death cannot be understood to mean eternal life in misery. Our traditional teaching on this subject is in need of urgent overhaul. If only we could just believe that death really means death, not life somewhere else. I don't doubt that there are some in our audience who reject the whole Christian faith because of what seems to them to be a barbaric view of God, namely that he has pledged himself to torture his creatures forever and ever. That same God is presented in the Bible as compassionate and loving even to his enemies. Even the worst of us is outraged when a human being is tortured for a few days, and yet traditional Christianity proposes to teach that the wicked will be tortured literally throughout endless ages without relief for billions and billions of years. If this is not taught in the Bible, what a ghastly affront to the character of God. We urge Christians to study this issue again. As encouragement, you may like to know that some leading evangelical scholars have recently expressed their opposition to the awful doctrine of eternal punishment, among them John Stott of London. Judge for yourselves what God will do with the wicked from the following verses. Isaiah 41, verses 11 and 12. All those who fight with God will be as nothing and non-existent. All God's opponents will perish. All those who fight with God will be as nothing, non-existent. Now surely that's a picture of the total extermination of the wicked. Ezekiel spoke of the destruction of the king of Tyre. Of him it is said, I will make you ashes upon your land. You will be a terror and you will never exist any more. If Ezekiel really meant conscious torment forever and ever, an eternal life in misery, could he possibly have used this sort of language? Again, in the prophet Obadiah, we find these words, the heathen will be as though they had never been. In Proverbs 10.25, there's another impressive description of how God intends to deal with his enemies. I quote, as the whirlwind passes, so is the wicked no more. Apart from one or two passages in the book of Revelation, Nothing even hints at the notion of endless conscious punishment. A key verse is Jude 7. The eternal fire described there is clearly not a fire which never goes out. 
This should guide us in our understanding of expressions like eternal punishment. This is an ultimate punishment which destroys the wicked forever and keeps them out of the kingdom of God. Finally, we might mention 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 9. The wicked will be punished with eternal destruction, that verse says. This again means destruction having to do with the coming age. It tells us nothing about the length of any conscious punishment. It will be the supernatural destruction brought about by divine fire. It seems to us quite impossible that destruction can mean preservation in a life of misery forever and ever. Destruction is the very word in the Greek language which means not existing forever. When Plato spoke of the soul of man, he believed it to be indestructible, wrongly of course, and Paul uses the very opposite word when he speaks of the condition of the wicked. They are destroyed. They do not have immortality, and so they die. They cease to exist. Man, you see, is destructible. It was the devil who said in Genesis 3 verse 4 that man would not die. Psalm 118 verse 12 speaks of the wicked being extinguished like a fire of thorns. I'm sure you remember the burning bush seen by Moses. You recall that the bush was on fire, but it was not consumed. If the Bible said something similar about the wicked burning and yet not being consumed, there would be evidence for the doctrine of eternal punishment. But there's no such evidence. The wicked are consistently said to be consumed in the fire of God's wrath. Thankfully, all wickedness is going to come to an end. All tears will be wiped away and all pain will be abolished forever. If that is so, it must be clear that there cannot be an eternal hellfire torturing the wicked without relief literally forever and ever. That is one of the myths which tradition has handed down to us. It originates with the so-called church fathers, Tertullian, and later the immensely influential Augustine. But these men were tragically under the power of Greek philosophy and its idea of the immortal soul. This, as we have seen, is not a Bible teaching at all. And so when the wicked perish, they will cease to be.